Okay. Um, hello again. Hello? Thank you. Uh, if folks will come in and have a seat, we're going to start our final panel. And we may just have saved the best for last. I, th I, think, I think this might be it. Like, I mean, we've had some good stuff, but I think, I think this might be it. I don't know. So get your Kleenex out, your cameras. I just, it's going to be goosebumps. Um, how are folks doing? Anyone ready to stick a fork and feeling done? Are you ready for, ready for one more? Um, so we've got one more panel to do, and then I'm going to wrap us up, and we'll, we'll send people on their way. My sense as I walked around is the, the workshops were really powerful. I saw a lot of people engaging, connecting, listening, a lot of head nodding. Um, so my, my guess is you're pretty full of ideas, and we're going we're gonna to put one more piece uh, in the puzzle. Um, and I have a conversation about, about leadership, um, which, of course, is what we've been talking about all along. And one of the powerful uh, ideas behind Ashoka is to help us rethink what leadership looks like. Um, and we're very lucky not only to have an amazing panel, um, but an amazing uh, moderator, um, Adam Bryant. Uh, so some of you may read his article in the New York Times. It's one of my favorites uh, in uh, the Corner Office. And he's also the best-selling author of the Corner Office, Indispensable and Unexpected Lessons from CEOs on How to Lead and Succeed. Um, so this is a, a, a writer, a thinker who interviews leaders and asks them questions. Um, sometimes hard questions, sometimes funny questions, and sometimes he gets hard things back and sometimes funny things back. There's a CEO out there who, in the interview process, reads people's palms as part of the interview process, which I will now integrate into my own interviewing process. This should be part of the Ashoka method, Bill. Like the final stage after you get interviewed, you can come in and read people's palms or tea leaves. Um, so, uh, Adam's a reporter, uh, New York Times business reporter, um, but, but much more than that. Um, so, um, trying to build out this idea of um, what we can learn from leaders by talking to leaders, um, not just in articles and books, but how do we bring that practical information to people's lives, whether it's at uh, colleges and universities, whether it's in forums and workshops like this. This idea that knowledge is it's great to have it online, that people can read but actually trying to make that uh, come alive. Um, his daughter, Anna, is here, or Anna, can you raise your hand? Proud, proud of your pops. Um, and also an exceptional uh, pizza maker. Um, and there's a rumor going around, you all probably heard it when you were getting your snacks, that Adam has the best recipe for pesto, pear, brie pizza in the world. Um, I know I heard about it, uh, washing my hands in the bathroom. So, um, well known for that. And he makes his dough from scratch. So um, let's, let's just give him a round of applause for that, uh, as well as all of his work. Everybody a tough act to follow here. Um, thank you very much, Eric. Uh, thank you to Ashoka for the invitation. I'm really honored to be here. Um, it's always so inspiring to hear everybody's stories and about all the great work you're doing. In journalism, we often talk about the art of the good, dumb question and how a good, dumb question can re lead to really breakthrough investigative journalism. Um, I'm, I am, of course, telling you something you all already know, because uh, asking good, dumb questions is what all of you do. Um, you ask about, you ask yourself, why is the world this, this way, and can it be made better? Uh, and then you act on it. Um, and I love good, dumb questions. And we have a particularly good one we're going to talk about today, which is what are the essential skills and values for effective leadership? I'm eager to hear the thoughts of my fellow panelists on this question. I'm going to do super quick introductions of everybody. You can see their full bios in your program. Uh, Susan Peters is responsible for talent identification, leadership development, training, performance management and succession planning for all GE executives worldwide. What have you done for us lately, Susan? Um, Len, Len Schlesinger is president of Babson College. Uh, and what am I supposed to do to the guy to his left? I just, Bill Drayton's in the house, or? <laughs> uh, 
Um, quick note on the format. I'm going to set the table for the discussion. Uh, then maybe we'll have each of the panelists speak for a bit. I might ask a few questions just to get things rolling, and then we can turn over the Q&A to the audience. Um, a big part of this conference, of course, is about telling stories. So I thought it might make sense to tell you the quick story of how I started Corner Office. And I'm willing to do that as long as I don't have to share the stage with those TGIF kids. Um, <laughs> So uh, I was a business reporter for many years at the Times. I interviewed a lot of CEOs. And what dawned on me uh, after a while is that CEOs are pretty much always interviewed in the business press as strategists. The basic architecture of a CEO interview in the business press is what is your growth plan? What is the competitive landscape you're facing? I enjoyed doing them. There's a big audience for them. I learned a lot. But I just found the more time I spent with CEOs, the more I just became interested in them as people and wanted to ask them really simple questions like, how do you do what you do? Uh, then I became a manager myself about a dozen years ago and discovered firsthand how hard it is to manage people. And that made me want to ask these CEOs, how did you learn to do what you do? Because I do think there's this impression with CEOs that they're born leaders, right? From the time they were in diapers, they knew exactly how to do it. Um, and I thought, that can't be right. So I rolled all of that up into a good, dumb question. Um, and the good, dumb question is, what if I sat down with CEOs and literally never asked them a single question about their companies, their products, and their strategies, but instead asked them about leadership lessons they've learned over the course of their life, um, the culture they try to foster, how they hire, uh, and what's their career advice for people? So that was kind of the initial question more than four years ago, more than 200 interview years, interviews ago. Uh, and it's been a remarkable adventure. I've just heard so many great insights uh, from these CEOs about leadership uh, and about teamwork. Uh, I didn't set out to write a book. There's lots of leadership books out there. But I just found the more time I spent with them, I started hearing echoes uh, and patterns and themes that would emerge from the interviews. And it got me curious about what is it about these people that explains why they get to the corner office. And we talked about the art of the good, dumb question. Um, to be clear, I'm not the first person to sit down with CEOs and ask them questions like this. There are books filled with, uh, written by people who have done this before. Um, but again, a lot of it comes back to asking the right question. Because uh, what I've realized over time, once I had this insight, I see evidence of this everywhere, that most people ask the question, essentially, what is the key to your success? And if you ask people just that question, you're kind of going to get the same answer, some variation of perseverance and hard work. <laughs> right? And it makes sense. I mean, ask anybody in any field, what's the secret of your success? Like, you're going to get some variation of that. Um, it's not very helpful. It's not very insightful. Um, and the other thing that happens is that people get kind of trapped by their own context. Uh, and if you go on YouTube and look at presentations from people, brand name people, successful people, about what they consider the keys to your success, um, Again, uh, they do get trapped by their context. I'll give you There's one person in particular. I found this, um, his, his list of 10 things, um, keys to success. Have a good work ethic. Make a plan. Look for big things. Don't be afraid to make a decision. Embrace change. Don't cheat. Have a good breakfast. OK, that last one was a joke. Um, <laughs> But I, I throw that in there to make a point, which is that this stuff isn't that helpful, right? We kind of all know this as a, at an intuitive level. Um, so what I did was say, let's assume those are the table stakes, all the obvious stuff about how you know make a decision, work hard, don't cheat, all those things. And then you, then you ask, if those are the table stakes, why are these people successful? What do they have? that is different from other people. And so what I did was sort of create this framework, a hypothetical large company, I don't know, maybe GE or something. Imagine uh, 100 people. They're all, say, 35, and they all have the same title. They're all at the same rank. And then let's assume they have those table stakes qualities. So then you ask the question, some people from that group are going to get promoted from that 100. And from that smaller group, fewer people are going to get promoted. And the ranks are going to keep thinning all the way to the top. 
And that's the question that I'm trying to answer. Well, what is it about the person who gets promoted over everybody else that explains why they get to the top? And it's very interesting because as I was thinking about Ashoka and this talk and the five qualities, I want to run through them very quickly for you. Um, what's really remarkable is that as much as I interview mostly CEOs of for-profit companies, I do interview a lot of leaders of nonprofits, that I, I'm going to be holding up a mirror to all of you. Because in what you do and in the stories that I've heard and the work you've done, um, these qualities really describe you. So uh, I also want to make uh, this important caveat clear that I don't feel like I've cracked some magic code. Uh, this is just kind of my take on pattern recognition and the roughly million words from the transcripts I had from all the interviews. If all of you did the same exercise, you would come up with your own list, but this is mine. So there's five qualities. Um, the first one is passionate curiosity, just a deep engagement with the world, a kind of relentlessly uh, questioning mind, curious about people, their backstories, how things work, how they could be made to work better. Um, this was captured. I interviewed Jeff Weiner of LinkedIn, and he told me about a very interesting word that he had heard. It's called neoteny. N-E-O-T-E-N-Y, and it is, uh, it's from the animal science world. It's the retention of juvenile qualities in the adult animal. And I know a lot of you are thinking right now, you, got, you know some guys who have totally nailed this. <laughs> um, but, it, but it is a great word because it really speaks to having the sort of beginner's mind and just always being sort of a newcomer to any situation you ask those really big sick questions. And I really believe that this, there's, a, there's a great head fake in the world today about CEOs and leaders often. Um, you know, the typical glossy business magazine cover has the CEO, the arms folded, and they're photographed like they can see around corners and that they have all the answers. But to me, the great head fake is that leaders, it's not so much their job to have the answers, it's to have the right questions. Um, it's to frame the question in the right way that can really not only galvanize their organization, take it in new directions, but also ask those good, dumb questions that can launch wonderful projects. Um, this was driven home to me by a CEO I interviewed named Andy Coslett, and he said he spends a lot of time in his job just going up to people in his company and say, why do you do that? Just that why, why, why. As he says, the really big prizes in business are found when you can ask a question that challenges the corporate orthodoxy. And I think that's true of life in general. So that's number one. Number two is battle-hardened confidence, which is developing a track record of facing down adversity and succeeding through it. Um, I think this is one of the reasons why hiring is so hard. This is what I hear from so many of the CEOs. They hire somebody that look great on paper. Uh, they think they'll be a great employee six months into the job. You have to put them on the hot seat. And that's where you find out what people are really made of. Some people rise to the occasion, and other people fold in that context. Um, the third one is what I call a simple mindset, which is the ability to take a lot of complicated stuff in the world, and there's a lot of it, and really distill it down to the one, two, or three things um, that really matter. Uh, there was a day not that long ago where just having raw data could be a competitive advantage for companies, but now it's all out there for everyone to see because of the internet. So the real value you're adding is, is synthesizing and distilling. Uh, and I do think this is one of the most important skills for leaders to be able to stand up at an all-hands meeting of, of your staffs and say, these are the three things that we're going to focus on this year. I guarantee you, if you stand up and say, these are the 12 things I'm thinking about right now, people are going to be checking their phones in a second, wondering when lunch is. Um, I am reminded of the power of simplicity uh, in my interviews all the time. There's this moment that happens so predictably. I make a $20 bet with myself um, when this happens. So I, I often ask the leaders I interview in the course of the conversation, have you codified the values of your organization? Some companies have, some haven't, but it's always an interesting avenue. Um, and as, if they say, yes, we have, then if they say, um, we have seven, or we have eight, that's when I make the $20 bet with myself, that they are going to forget one of them. <laughs> I, 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 call, I call this the hand moment, because this is what happens. You know, when they say, yeah, we have seven, I say, oh, I'd love to hear what they are. They go like this. 
And then there's, if there's a PR person in the room, they shoot them a silent glance that says, if I forget one, cover me. Um, and again, it happens so often that I almost always win these $20 bets. Um, I once had a CEO have to, had to uh, rummage through his briefcase to get his iPhone to look up his own company's values. Um, and it's just, it's, to me, it's such a stark reminder that if the CEO can't remember their own company's values, how can they expect everybody else to? Um, I love the number three. Two is even better, but uh, as, as I think leaders are really doing their job when they can distill every speech they have down to three things because people can remember three things. The fourth quality is team smarts, um, which is kind of the organizational equivalent of street smarts, and we know what that is. It's just sort of how to get things done in an organization. You understand where all the soft levers of power are. Um, Susan Line uh, really nailed this point. She said, the people who truly succeed know how to mobilize people who are not their direct reports. Now, this is, of course, you know, she's talking from the corporate world, but that's essentially what all of you do. You are mobilizing people who are not your direct reports. Uh, and that's a super important skill that I think all of you have in spades. Um, speaking of skills you have in spades, the final quality I call fearlessness, um, which is really just a bias towards action. Let's do things. Let's shake things up. Um, Ursula Burns of Xerox talked about this. She said, fearlessness is seeing an opportunity even though things are not broken. Um, and again, I feel like I'm just holding up a mirror to all of you because you know this so well. Um, the thing about this list of five that's always intriguing for me is that um, over the course of 200 interviews, I get a lot of reminders of the importance of these things. And I had a serendipitous moment where I interviewed a guy named Mark Templeton who runs Citrix. Uh, and I asked him, as I often do, how do you hire? What qualities are you looking for? Uh, and he told me the following two things. And if I could just read you a couple of short paragraphs. He says, the things I value start with curiosity, because curiosity is a measure of self-motivation. People who are curious will develop themselves. They'll discover things. They'll invent things. You look for demonstrations of curiosity, because that is where someone has done something on their own time that's outside the band of what they would normally be doing. Passion and curiosity. The second thing I look for, he said, is scars. You can call it wisdom, you can call it experience, or the things that went wrong in your life. That's where I think knowledge turns into wisdom. A lot of people will have facts and information. I'm looking for wisdom. The things that went wrong, and what you did about them, and how they shaped you as a person, and your beliefs. Battle hardened confidence, or scars. Um, so that's my take. Um, I'd love to hear what the panelists have to say about this core question of what have you seen over the course of your life as the skills and qualities that really separate leaders? And maybe, Susan, we could start with you. OK, thanks, Adam. Uh, never stop evolving, we all rise. I heard that there were a lot of people who introduced themselves over the last day or so with six words. So those are the six words I chose. Never stop evolving, we all rise, because that sort of represents the way we think about leadership development. The idea that never stop evolving requires everybody, and we think of all of our employees as leaders because leadership is really a very personal journey into yourself, and it can be something that you work on all the time. And while some leaders may evolve to the corner office, everybody can be a better leader. So we think about the never stop evolving part by um, providing to our employees the expectations of leadership in today's world. And you know that's sort of a constant thing. You have to think about leadership development the way many people think about product development. The whole idea of a multi-generation product plan. And the example that I might use is uh, a cell phone. And I would wager that nobody in this audience is using the same cell phone that they used five years ago. And the reason for that is because that new product provides new capability. You have higher expectations of what it'll do for you. And the same is true for leaders and leadership and you. You are not the same person you were five years ago. You wouldn't want to work with or for people who hadn't changed in five years. So it's incumbent on us to ensure that people understand what is the new functionality that's expected as a leader. So never stop evolving. We all rise. If every leader, every person does something a skill, an interface, a dialogue, a little bit better each time they do it. 
if they have higher expectations of themselves as a result of the learning and the evolution as a leader, they have higher expectations for themselves, for the people around them, the people that work with them on teams, and then together we all rise. So that's sort of the way we think about leadership development, and I look forward to the discussion. Good. Len? Super. Uh, my five words are, oh shit, I go next. <laughs> <laughs> And what do you do now at this point? Um, so in 1993, in 1993 at the Army War College, they tasked a collection of military folks to address the fundamental issue of defining the nature of the environment in which the West Point was going to have to rethink their leadership strategy. Um, and they articulated a phrase that I'm sure many of you are comfortable with uh, or have heard before called VUCA, volatile, uncertain, chaotic, and ambiguous, as a, a characterization of the environment in which we were going to have to develop leaders to be able to uh, thrive and grow in the 21st century and evolve to a very simple uh, model that doesn't have five elements to it. It essentially is be, no do. Okay, so know yourself, know some stuff, uh, and do some stuff. And we'll talk a little bit about that in the context of what we know about what we call entrepreneurial leadership at Babson. Um, that environment actually renders uh, for for-profit and social enterprises many of the things we've long held about, uh, about management and leadership to be increasingly uh, irrelevant. If you look at the major contributions of applied social science on the leadership question going all the way back to Stogdall's Handbook of Leadership that any of you have a doctorate have been burdened with having to read. It's 768 pages of small print. And the only conclusions they're able to define that are empirically supported is the leader sets high standards and expresses caring. Uh, so now we call expressing caring a modified empathy, okay? Setting high standards, we'll figure out how to fit it into the other five boxes. But the reality is um, we have lots of people who talk about what they do, and increasingly uh, we begin to discover that there's very, very little relationship between what people say they do and what they actually do. And so I'm naturally suspicious uh, of a lot of these interviews. And so what we've been beginning to do, um, uh, no, what ends up happening is, is, and particularly in entrepreneurship literature, an entrepreneur uh, in any sort of startup, a social enterprise or a, or a for-profit enterprise, hits it big, has an amazing success. And what do they generally do? They hire a ghostwriter to rewrite their life. Uh, and, uh, and tell the story the way they would like it to be told, okay? Uh, and in the hopes that you will read that story and hope that you can grow up to be just like them. Uh, and, and what it tends to do is disenfranchise people from engaging uh, in these leadership behaviors because I didn't have the luck, I wasn't willing to take the risk, I wasn't willing to mortgage my family, I didn't really care all that much to be able to do this. And so what we've been going back is saying, let's, let's, let's actually follow a variety of people who are in these leadership positions, whether they be the startup of for-profit or social enterprises, or trying to work inside large organizations, trying to affect substantive change. Uh, and, and what is it that they do that really makes a difference? Okay? By, by watching them really carefully and by restoring the tradition of applied social science that was mastered in the 60s by Cotter and Mintzberg and Rosemary Stewart when we actually figured out that managers did more than plan, organize, direct, and control. I mean, for any of you, I mean, you took the same management course I took, and that's not the way it happens, okay? It's just a convenient set of boxes that we organize a course into. Uh, and so the reality is what we're discovering is uh, clearly um, a leader has to want to do something. So we kind of build on the notion of passionate curiosity. If you don't care about something, you're not likely to be an effective leader in that characterization. We play with it. Number two is um, there's all too much attention uh, to taking risk. All too much attention to taking risk. The really talented entrepreneurial leaders that we spend time, a lot of time with, have figured out how to reduce risk, have figured out how to take the first step for almost no risk, okay? Uh, and have figured out how to syndicate risk, okay? And so most of the literature that celebrates people hanging by their fingernails, having mortgaged their families, just actually doesn't help any of us really develop our own capabilities in that space. So I think that's problematic. We call it acceptable or affordable loss. The literature tends to really support that. They bring others along. So you know at the end of the day, um, it is all about the team. It is all about engaging others. And it is recognizing uh, that leadership is essentially about an act of co-creation, even though the leadership literature is entirely about creation. Okay? 
you know, we can celebrate the Howard Schultz's of the world and how Starbucks got created. But the reality is it was a manifestation of 1,465 customers who were incredibly pissed off about his first venture called Il Giornale, which required you to listen to opera music, uh, order an Italian, and stand for a $3.50 drink. <laughs> Okay, and they all contributed to the creation of Starbucks. That's truly an act of, of entrepreneurial leadership. Uh, the fourth is to recognize that stuff does happen, and to use the environment and all the stuff that happens as uh, as a powerful learning experience, and then repeat. Okay, so it's like wash, repeat, uh, and uh, the ability to recognize that the environment is sufficiently complex. Okay that we need a much more open leadership model, a much more inclusive and welcoming leadership model is at the core of what we try to do at Babson and what also we try to teach and is very much consistent with what we're hearing up to this point. Great, Bill. So uh, Eric uh, mentioned tea leaves. All of you know our selection process for staff and fellows and think goat entrails. Uh, this is really, really important, completely central. So w the three words I would use, you all know, everyone a change maker. Um, that guides individual behavior, our organizational behavior, our objective of the world we're trying to help create. And everyone means everyone. Change maker is the ability to give, um, that's really powerful. And that's what brings people the greatest happiness, health, and longevity. So this is actually very simple, but it's in the context of the world going through the very profound transformation that this whole gathering has been focused on. We are leaving the world of repetition and authority, and some of the things Glenn was pointing to was not such good leadership. And now we have to help everyone make this transition um, to an everyone a change maker world where everything is changing and that VUCA principle is at work. It's a new phrase that I'm going to pick up on. Um, and just as we started off uh, yesterday, Entrepreneurs are different, social entrepreneurs are more different, the world we're going into is different. And so our gift is the ability to see that and be able to help other people see it. And I, I just, in terms of leadership, the nature of the task now, the first is envisage, second enable, and third, which is a little trickier, ensure. Um, so Within Ashoka, we've got to be an everyone an entrepreneur organization. Um, the criteria are pretty simple. Uh, entrepreneur, so at least pattern change, framework change. Get and believe, really, internally, the everyone a change maker goal that we're going to. Uh, social emotional intelligence. And then the last is really important very strong ethical fiber. Um, you can't have a fluid open team of teams. You can't have a team unless everyone trusts everyone else. And people have to be trustworthy to do that. And that means fundamental skills, starting with cognitive empathy, <coughs> teamwork. This new type of leadership, envisage, enable, ensure, and uh, change making. Great. Um, one of the things that I do in my interviews, and I said this earlier, is that you can't just ask people what's the key to your success. Um, so I try to triangulate a lot uh, to try and get people's insights on leadership. One of the ways I do that is I always ask, how do you hire? What questions do you ask? Um, and then just to put the three of you in a hot seat even more, I'll ask the question that I often ask the CEOs that, if it was a hypothetical speed dating situation where you had five minutes to interview somebody um, and you only could ask them two, maybe three questions to decide then whether you're going to hire this person for a leadership position compared to somebody else or the other people you're going to have these speed dating interviews with, what would those two or three questions be? 
And if you want a minute to think, I can talk to everybody about how to cook pizza on the grill. <laughs> I'll just hum a few bars here to give people time to think. But one of you want to go first? Or? I'm, I'm a sucker for smart, verbal people. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I can fall in love with people two minutes into an interview, and so I don't allow myself to be involved in making the hiring decision. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is an example of knowing yes. yourself, <laughs> which is the first step of leadership, let me, right? Let me ask a follow-up then. Have you ever hired anybody? Oh, yeah. But, it but it, for me, yes. okay, if it's a critical, it takes hours. Right. Right? It's, it's meals. It's conversation. It's cumbersome. It's... But it's, I really feel like they need to know me and what we're trying to do as an organization. I need to know yeah. them. Um, and I'm also a devotee of also recognizing that I'm going to drill down on all aspects of your past. There's a, a book that came out about, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago uh, about smart interviewing. Mm -hmm. And at each step of the process as I go through somebody's life, it's yeah. if I called your critical boss at this stage of your life, yeah. what would they be telling me? Not that I'm going to do it, but, but I want you thinking I'm going to do it. Okay. And again, uh, the key word there is critical. That's right. Right. Critical stages. And so, so, we, so it just, for me, I can't, I can't do it quick. If I do it quickly, I will get it wrong. What if I gave you $100 million to do it quickly? <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 I would end up pissing away the $100 million anyway. So, 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 so I would, I just wouldn't Are you going to give me $100 I'm million? Give because I'm, I'll, I'll do it quickly. <laughs> she's much smarter and much more refined, but I just wouldn't get sucked into it. So, uh, in the speed dating, uh, speed interviewing thing, I might ask a question something like, tell me your story. Mm -hmm. And leave it that open-ended. Because, first of all, I think what's important is to, you're learning several things. How do people structure their answer? People who are very structured ask you questions like, well, what do you want to know? Uh, well, where should I start? Uh, well, uh, let me, you know, they tend to be much more structured. So, maybe that's good. Maybe that's what you're looking for. Uh, but I think giving people free reign to have them articulate what has been important in their lives, whether that they take you all the way back to their childhood or high school, you know, senior year class president or whatever, I think that tells you a lot. And you're really listening for not only their experiences, how, what they articulate and how they articulate them, but what do they think is important in this short period of time. So that might be one that I would do because I'm going for the hundred million. <laughs> <laughs> you could probably make productive use of it. <laughs> and, and I've heard um, other CEOs use that approach and they say it's great for the reasons you cite and they say it's an instant read on how the person thinks because some people respond, they start going through the checklist or the timeline of their life. Well, I was right. born here Thanks. and then I did this and other people just say, well, this is what's important to me and this is why I want this job. So, um, Bill, do you want to take that on? Well, I agree with you both. Uh, anyone who knows me, it, it takes me a very long time. But I do have some things that I think are especially important. And you mentioned middle and high school. And I, it's, life gets more complicated, and it's harder to figure out who was doing what um, later. But at that point, people really know who they are. And if you can understand what they were doing in middle and high school, you actually probably have a pretty good sense of what they're going to do in the rest of their lives. <laughs> so the, the, the second thing that I think is really important is the ethical fiber part, because nothing works without that. And especially if you're an entrepreneur, you're always going into someone's office and saying, now, please do something that you would never do and you've never thought about. And it's, it, it can't be the words. Um, they're making a judgment about you, and you walk in, and I trust this person, and then they're saying, oh, this person, the idea, are married, there's no, so I can sort of trust this idea. Then you have a chance with the words. So I, and you can't build a team or a team of teams without it. It's just completely fundamental. But it's, and there are some things you can get at cognitively, but this is really, your early brain is much better at this. And so the hardest thing is to help myself and everyone else figure out how to access your early brain. And um, there's a, a, a mechanism that we found to be very useful 
Uh, I'm terrified of heights. Maybe it's snakes for you, but there's almost always something that people are rationally afraid of. Um, so I've had a conversation with someone. They leave. I close my eyes. I imagine I'm on the edge of a cliff edge. And if I, and I think about the person, if I reach for the edge of the chair, there's a problem. Um, and what's, what I've done is, in effect, is I have brought the early brain, it's nervous already because I'm on a cliff edge. And the cerebral cortex doesn't have a chance to intervene because, you know, the early brain is already there and then it tells you. So, I mean, there, there are a variety of mechanisms, but ethical fiber is the most fundamental thing and you have to get at it. The other thing is, and this is one of Len's points, is that we do this society-wide through juries and other group mechanisms, and that's important. So our selection process always has a jury phase. And you know, if one person has a tickle, that's okay, but if three people do, then we really have a problem. And uh, then we start thinking about it and go and look at it much more closely. So I, I think those would be the two I would focus on. Okay, great. Um, at the risk of stating the obvious, uh, one of the things that I've really learned through the process of doing these interviews uh, is just how personal leadership is. Uh, as much as, can you still hear me? Um, as much as people like to write books that are effectively, you know, suit off the rack, put this on, you'll be a leader, lead my way, that's not how it works. Um, and again, the risk of stating the obvious, I think leadership is always shifting and it's based on three things. Who you are as a person, um, the people you're leading, and the context in which you're leading. So there's no, you can't sort of freeze frame it and say this is how to do it. And I get weekly reminders because um, of the, just how personal leadership is. Because pretty much every week somebody, a reader, reader will email me and say, I've been reading Corner Office from the start. This was the best one yet. And ten minutes later I'll get an email from somebody saying, or a colleague, I'll run into a colleague in the cafeteria and I go, you know that guy this Sunday? I didn't like that guy. <laughs> um, and it's just, I've, I've come to realize that these interviews I do are like Rorschach tests. They're ink blots. We, we project all our kind of stuff on them and read things into them um, that we want. So leadership is personal. The other strategy I use um, in my interviews to triangulate, to get away from the, what do you consider the key to your success is, I ask people, what do you consider the most important leadership lessons that you've learned over your life? And I'm really trying to find maybe the one or two moments that really were kind of crucible moments for them where they learned an important leadership lesson that really influenced the way they lead and manage. So if I could, I'd like to ask each of you to think of a story, uh, a leadership lesson that you learned over the course of your life, a moment that has really stayed with you and kind of was an inflection point for you. You don't want to do this in order, do you? <laughs> You're already wealthy. You got a hundred million dollars. So let's. <laughs> well, I don't usually tell this story, but it's an impactful one. And I, it, this is a story you, you're really asking for. Personal, personal stories, stories yes, you know. please. I thought we were going to get to talk about other people, but here we are <laughs> talking about ourselves. So I was, um, I'll do this briefly. Many of you have at least heard of Jack Welch by reputation, and it was in the mid-90s. It's kind of a long story. Um, it's not even worth the context of what um, issue he had with something we were doing in the business that I was the senior HR leader for at the time. but. Uh, he basically took me on in a small group, five or six people, setting in a very intense way, as he's known to do. And Jack is a very intense in individual. And of course, I'm like five layers below him at this time. And so it was a lesson in structure, that's the big boss, uh, but in intensity. And what was the really important lesson was what he said. And what he told me was that I was focusing too much on sort of the, um, the list and not on the big picture, the get it done, the sort of the day-to-day -day things that we have to do as opposed to stepping back and looking at the holistic thing. Now, he didn't use those words. He used some many more colorful words, <laughs> but that was the essence of what he said. And I can tell you that it was hugely impactful feedback, A, because it was given in a clear, direct way, and I think it's a, 
a real failure in our system at all levels, frankly, that we don't give direct, clear feedback because it's a powerful learning tool. And he was right. And it, it helped me shift the way I think about myself in this journey of leadership to stepping back and looking at things, you know, like a lens in a camera, just pulling it back instead of always being on the details. And there are too many of us that think that leadership is about accomplishment and getting all this done and, you know, hard work and all the things you mentioned that, that are on the standard 10 list. And I think it's much more about understanding context and perspective. And in a subsequent uh, question, we'll talk a little bit more perhaps about getting access to that context because that's really what sometimes is missing. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my personal story. Bill, do you want to mix up the order? Sure. Um, I was just talking about ethical fiber, and I, I, I benefited through a lifelong of being exposed to people, starting with my parents, who have very strong feelings about this. And my dad was actually sort of Victorian in his view. He felt there was a thin veneer of civilization. And you better work hard to protect it. So if something was wrong, you had to go and deal with it. So all the way through, uh, you know, the civil rights movement was the Gandhian movement. Well, Gandhi was, I believe, the most brilliant person in the last century because he understood that the revolution we've been talking about here was happening. And everybody had to move to empathy-based ethics because it was enough change everywhere that you couldn't live a good life by rule-based ethics, which is what 98, 99% of people could do in isolated, small, static villages. Once you're at that point, then um, we are genetically driven uh, to be a part of society. We don't do well without that. And this now becomes absolutely central to everyone's ability. And he understood that that moment of transition, you can cause change uh, by asking people, sort of persuading them to compare their behavior to this absolutely first principle of you being a part of society, you being a good person. And people will change their behavior absolutely predictably. And the, the nonviolence thing is an adjective. If, if you coerce people, then they're not making the decision and this doesn't happen. So um, that had a, a very, very big impact. Any of you who are part of the civil rights generation, you just, I can't tell you how powerful it was to see people changing in front of your eyes. So I was involved in helping the Northern Student Movement get started, and we had a project in the eastern shore of Maryland, went back and forth from Cambridge. Uh, it was very powerful. Now, the, here's the story that I want to tell you, because this is all background. I don't, I don't think it's one story isn't it. It's a whole coherent pattern. Um, this is my, I was at McKinsey in my third month. And New York City was about to go bankrupt uh, because it couldn't borrow any more money. The only alternative was to raise a lot of new taxes, 1.4 billion. And this is when 1.4 billion was really a lot of money. <laughs> and the mayor, then Mayor Lindsay, knew that the finance administration couldn't do this. So they had six weeks. And so they came to McKinsey. And they said, well, we have one associate who's never been to business school, so he's the obvious person to work on this. That was me. Um, and so this is wonderful, a candy store, a recycling incentive tax, a leaded gasoline tax. And then this is one where the trouble comes, the tar and nicotine tax. So high tar and nicotine cigarettes had a higher tax, and that meant that when you went to buy one, you had a pretty clear message that there was something different. And it was designed to get the uh, companies to shift their marketing to push low tar and nicotine cigarettes. Uh, all right, so I was at home in the village working away on this, and I got a phone call from the guy who ran the Bureau of the Budget. 
you've got to come to a meeting. What is this tax? We've been called by the cigarette industry. They want to have a meeting. Okay, so I show up at this meeting two days later. The industry, shall we say, was not truthful. What to do? Uh, so I very politely said, well, I've been talking to some of your people. It doesn't seem to be quite that way. The meeting did not go well from that point onward. The industry asked, please, everyone say who you are. So I very innocently and probably stupidly wrote Bill Drayton, comma, McKinsey and Company. Went about my business. A few hours later, I got back to the office. And just as I was coming in, in comes this guy twice, maybe more my age, easily twice my weight. That's not very hard. <laughs> and looking very unhappy. Are you Drayton? Yes. Uh, this is not good. Um, and it went downhill from there. Um, what do you think this is, a Nader office? Anyway, so uh, I went off to see the partner I was working for, and there was radio silence for the next two weeks. I did everything possible to make this tax irreversible, stirred up the health industry, etc. Then I was invited to lunch at the Racket Club. I've never been to the Racket Club before, but for those of you who know New York, it's a rather established institution, so we say. And I was going with the head of the marketing practice, who was the guy who'd come to my office, the head of the public practice, and someone I had never heard of, Marvin Bauer, who just turned out to be basically the founder of the firm and an icon. Um, lunch. No one says anything about this. They talk about old school ties. What is going on? <laughs> Halfway through coffee, Marvin turns to the head of this large tobacco company, who is a very big client. New York City is a very small client. And says, I understand you're concerned about the work we've been doing for New York. And um, tell me about it. And so he did, expecting that the firm would then do something about it. Uh, Marvin then said, coffee now being pretty much over, um, we serve 40% of the top 500 companies in America, and no one has ever questioned our professionalism, although we're always serving competitors. And since you have this concern, uh, we can no longer serve you, and we will no longer serve you. Now that was really powerful. And I believe that that's why McKinsey is a great firm. Um, it's not because people are smarter, but people can trust one another internally, and therefore you get better thinking. And I'm sure I was there to bear witness, which is what I'm doing. Marvin was a really great leader, and it was all about ethical fiber. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Yeah. My first job, after, because I, I went to business school, so I didn't do anything sexy like taxes. Um, my, my first job after business school was to be a first-line supervisor on the night shift in a paper mill in Green Bay, Wisconsin. I was born and raised in New York, so this qualified as my first overseas assignment. <laughs> and also, I didn't understand at that time, now I'm a college president with an evening MBA program, I understand what it's about, but I had a daytime MBA, and I didn't understand that it didn't qualify me for anything that happened at night in a, in a factory. <laughs> But I was managing, I was making facial tissue. And, and you know, I don't know if any of you ever think about how you actually get 200 sheets in a box, OK? But there's a process, OK? Uh, and, and you have all these big rolls that are all pink. And then someone says, well, we got enough pink. We need some white facial tissue. So take down the 200 rolls of pink and put up 200 rolls of white and start making white. And this group had been doing this for years. Uh, and any time there was a, quote, color change, it took 90 minutes. It was just written in, right? This is a union shop and everything. It's just institutionalized 90 minutes. Well, I was really smart. I studied this as part of my qualifications to assume a leadership role in the factory. And I had concluded it should take 61 minutes. And first night where I'm supervising on my own, Head operator says, we have a color change around 3 o'clock, so from 3 to 4.30, we'll be changing colors. I said, no, 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 it's 61 minutes. And I'll show you how it works if you need help. <laughs> so it's 3 o'clock, it's time for the color change, uh, and they start doing stuff so that it takes 90 minutes with appropriate smoke breaks and stuff in between. 
and I can see exactly what they're doing. And so I walk over to one guy, his name is Romy. Half the crew was Romy. And, <laughs> and so I went over to Romy and said, let me show you how I want to do this. And I got up on the fork truck, okay, and, and started moving the roll. And then, and was having a jolly old time, and then looked around and suddenly discovered there was nobody there. I mean, nobody. Everybody on the crew simply got up, walked off the job. I said, well, oh, this is interesting. <laughs> right? What do I do now? Right? And I walked over to the break room, and they're all having coffee and cigarettes and just laughing their rear ends off. They, they think this is the funniest thing in the world. I actually, I was naive enough to believe that I was, quote, their manager slash leader. And I didn't realize at this time that the company actually understood that their job was to train me. Uh, and uh, and I, I, I panicked. And I literally, I called my wife at 3.45 in the morning. She was thrilled about being in Green Bay in the first place. And so this just, <laughs> this, this just cemented it. Uh, and, uh, and I said, I, I was getting them to change the colors, and et cetera, and so forth. And, and they've all walked off the job. And they're all in the break room. What do I do now? <laughs> And she said, well, you know, you might want to go in and apologize. I said, for what? She goes, for whatever they think generated them walking off the job and going in the break room. And she goes, I, she goes being married to you, I understand this completely. Right? <laughs> so, so she goes, so now just go in and apologize and see where it goes. Okay? Uh, and that was, for me, I was so ticked off. I mean, I, I was a combination of scared and completely ticked off. And I went in, and I apologized. And they immediately threw out their coffee and put out their cigarettes and came out and said, and as they walked out, now, don't let this happen again. <laughs> and I actually started at the next team meeting, then what am I supposed to do? I mean, literally, what am I supposed to do? For God's sake, I have an MBA. It's only supposed to take 61 minutes. I'm trying to increase your productivity. Well, we can figure this out together, OK? But if you're just going to tell us what to do, be clear. We will do exactly <laughs> what you tell us to do. And I had one of those operators who did that. And the reality is I didn't know what to tell them to do after the first thing I asked them to do. So they just sit there and do it. Uh, and it was a, the most profound leadership learning experience I've ever had. I'll never forget it. It is just vividly imprinted uh, on, in my mind. And I owe line three facial just a deep gret of, a debt of gratitude uh, for showing me the natural limitations of a daytime MBA and actually beginning, and beginning to show me what that transition is from managing to leading. Right. That's wonderful. Wonderful story. Um, can we do sort of hurry up offense, bonus points for specific questions from the audience? Maybe we can get in two or three in our time. Um, I'm sort of discouraged people from saying, uh, what's your story uh, to the panelists? But if you have specific questions about leadership and would like to ask them, then we can get more questions covered. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so they, I would work for the State Department. That's as much of the story as you get. And uh, they used to call George Schultz the Buddha because he would never talk during the senior staff meetings. And so you were very trained as a State Department person to like listen to what your ambassador said so you could modify what you said and you know say the right thing. And so my question to you is, your senior level meetings, do you talk first or do you talk last? Bill, do you want to start? Um, there isn't uh, one or the other. Um, and again, I think this is very much a matter of context. If you know something and that no one else does, then maybe you should say something. But um, if someone else is leading in that area, it's much better to get them to do it, but even better is you say, OK, uh, who are the people leading this? Let's make sure that they are there um, and get them to lead the conversation. So at our executive team meeting this week, um, 
we were talking about. Um, very, very fundamental thing. We've started the tipping process I described yesterday for every child in the SMAS Trampathy, the 60 schools, etc. And um, an organizational transition we're going through so that in every metro area there's going to be probably 12 or 15 teams of, you know, Ashoka Fellow teams, Changemaker School teams, etc. And that becomes a team of teams in itself. So that we wanted to illustrate that by some of the experience that we're having in finding the schools to be Changemaker schools. Well, Laura White um, has been out dealing with the schools. And in doing that, she has been seeing synapses between the schools and one another and Ashoka U and et cetera. So she was the right person to lead that discussion and did. And I should also tell you about her that she was a youth venturer. And then when she went to Tulane, she was the leader of the team that helped Tulane become a great change maker campus. That's great. That's great. Len, do you want to take that up? Um, I, I actually have gotten to a stage in my life where if something's important to me and I have a point of view, I just say it, okay? Uh, but I want to be in an environment where we actually can legitimize disagreement. And the fact that I say it doesn't mean that's what's going to happen. Now, the great news around transitioning from a corporate environment to a, a, a collegiate environment, if I say it, it's almost certain to not happen. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and there's a much healthier culture of, of disagreement in that environment than I've experienced in a corporate environment. So actually, it turns not to be uh, not not to be as critical an issue in this environment as it's been in prior jobs. And I would just add that I'd like to introduce the concept of versatility in a leader, and again, leader at any level of the organization. The idea that as a leader, you have to know when to talk and when to listen, and in that listening mode, know when and how to ask questions. So I think that it isn't about just one or the other. Rarely is life ever about one extreme or the other, but having the, the sense and the versatility to be a good listener and a good speaker and communicator. And I'll just take a second to channel some of the CEOs I've interviewed. I've heard a lot of them. They essentially set up a very simple code for meetings. Um, they will say, you know, there are three types of meetings. There's one where I've, you know, I'm going to make the decision, but I want to hear your opinions. This is a total consensus decision or I want to hear everybody's opinion and I'll have the final word, or whatever. But just that they have some very simple code that they say, okay, this is a type one kind of meeting, and then everybody gets it. Um, so I think there's a lot of useful tricks for that. Other specific questions? Hmm? Okay. This is the, the last one, and then I'm gonna ask a very specific question of Susan, so I'm gonna retain the right to ask a 30 second question. But one more question from the audience. Who's ever got the microphone gets the right to choose. All right. Fellow Canadian. Wow. Uh, exciting. Last question. Um, this better be good. <laughs> pressure has been reduced. Thanks. Uh, we, are, uh, we are a lot of founders in this room, which I think is a distinctive role or, uh, of leadership. And you can tell uh, us founders we're wearing t-shirts and jeans, uh, except for Bill. Um, so I guess the question is both of Bill but other, the other panelists, and it was inspired uh, by a question that was recently asked of me. We get uh, within Engineers Without Borders Canada, we have lots of young people who get together and get to sit down and kind of talk uh, till two or three in the morning starting at eight, or eight at night about issues within the organization. And they asked the question of me, George, uh, how are you gonna know or how are we gonna know when you've outlived your welcome as a founder, and uh, what are you doing to change your habits and behaviors to allow this organization to flourish rather than to be held back by your leadership? So I'll ask that of Bill specifically. What are two or three things um, that you might be changing or looking at? And I'd love to get your reflection even just on that, on that question as us founders, which is a very emotional question, right? It's not just a head question, it's a heart question. Um, what does that look like? Um, it, it's obviously a really good question, so you did well. 
Um, uh, there's a, there's an element in it that may be embedded that I, I want to deal with first. Uh, if it's a matter of having an idea and then implementing it, that's a model that I don't think exists much anymore. Um, and I think what, yeah, so it doesn't. You, especially for a room full of entrepreneurs and people who are committed to that, the world is changing faster and faster. The idea is changing. The people are changing. So the founder, if that person is really strong on creativity, that is probably a value that isn't going to diminish. Um, the, the old paradigm, you've got to shift to a manager, I'm very suspicious of in this world. It didn't work very well at Apple, and I could give you a whole series of other examples. And it, it's a source of great sadness to many people in the Ashoka community that they make the mistake of not recruiting change makers, not recruiting entrepreneurs. And you then have a divided culture that doesn't work. So I, I, I think you need, it, we, we all have to very consciously be building, and everyone an entrepreneur, everyone a change maker, team of teams. And I'm, I'm avoiding some of the traditional words here. Now, once you have a team of teams, it, the whole concept of leadership is different. Um, the leader is not someone telling everyone else what to do with walls and vertical nervous systems and enforcement. It's envisage, enable, ensure. And everyone on the team has to be initiating, has to be changing, has to be entrepreneuring, or the team isn't going to do very well. And that's true for the whole team of teams. So if you think founder in the sort of traditional have an idea, it's, this, this is all a bad way of thinking, I think. Now, having said that, there are obvious risks. And um, it's a challenge that you know, I think we, everyone here faces. How do we really listen? Um, how do we create uh, an organization, a movement, where on the one hand, you're encouraging everyone to initiate. On the other hand, you've got to get some big things done, which is when I said earlier, envisage, enable, ensure. The third part is a little sticky. Um, and I think it's a function of being really good at if everyone says we're moving to an everyone a change maker world, in my mind, that is the equivalent in basketball of ball and basket. Once everyone agrees that that's what we're all trying to do, then you can move on to the place. And, but, and at each step of the level, you have a fluid, open team of teams connecting in every direction. And that's the architecture we have to come up with. And each of us has to learn how to play in that very different way. And one of the very nice things about this is that um, you're not going to get bored. What I am doing is so different from what I was doing a few years ago. I mean, it's just a different role, and it, which is really interesting. So there are risks. There has to be uh, a shift from the old overall structure to the fluid open team of teams. And then you know, everyone has to get used to everyone being a player on the basketball court. Len, do you want to take a quick cut? Yeah, that being said, I'm going to disagree a little bit. Uh, the, the challenges of startups and the challenges of scale-ups are strikingly different, okay? And strikingly different in tone and in content. Um, the answer, though, isn't this notion that uh, the scale-up requires a professional manager and the startup requires an entrepreneur. I think that's overly simplistic. But the question I would always ask myself as the startup entrepreneur is, do I actually want to do the work of scale-up or do I actually get much more of the jollies and excitement out of starting things? And, and I think that's the tension that comes more and more often. It's not this issue of the, quote, professional manager versus the entrepreneur. It is the sets of activities that allow you to derive the most pleasure. Now, no surprise, uh, in, this, uh, in this area, in social enterprise, we have a huge problem with scale-up. 
I mean, huge issues with scale-up. Uh, and so I really do believe there's some really serious questions that need to be asked in that space. I believe all of you are capable of doing that work. The question is whether you want to and whether the fact that you don't want to obscures a realistic <laughs> understanding of what needs to happen if, in fact, you're going to grow. And one CEO interviewed crystallized that point. It's about knowing yourself. The expression is, are you Army or Marine? Um, do you like storming the beaches, or do you like setting up the camp and making sure the fuel and water gets to the troops? And not everybody wants to do both. Mm. Um, can I ask, can we shift gears and ask you a very quick question? You've worked with so many executives, thousands, tens of thousands, um, and a lot of your work is done sort of coaching them, helping them get to the next level. Because of your sort of, in effect, database of experience, are there certain patterns that you see? Do you find yourself saying, these are the most three frequent pieces of advice that you and your staff give to people to help them get to the next level? Well, I think that there might be two sides of the coin on that question. One is, what would you, how do you coach people? And the second might be, what do you see as the attributes of those people that you want to coach? Right. You know, what are, who are the people that sort of come out of the pile, the hundred that yeah. you mentioned earlier? And to, to start with that first, I do think, and it really speaks to, I believe your name was George's question about how do you continuously evolve and develop yourself as a leader, whether you're in an entrepreneurial or a startup or scale-up environment, the whole goal of leadership is to never stop evolving, to in constantly ensure that you're taking yourself outside of your comfort zone. And if you're not doing it, or if your environment isn't doing it, you have to find ways to do it. These days, the environment's doing it for a lot of us. Um, I don't know that everybody's leveraging that as much as they could or should. They, you know, people tend to stay in the space they're in. If you're working in healthcare, you're deep in healthcare. If you're working in, you know, Africa, you're deep in Africa. And what I'm talking about is changing up your context to the extent where you are doing something totally different frequently enough that you're getting a different perspective, that you're dialoguing with people who are farmers and academics and philanthropists and pianists, really a, ver a variety of people because we tend to be in our own space. So we're looking for the people who have demonstrated within our context this, you know, I get it, I have to think bigger, I have to be able to uh, contextualize my work. And then the coaching aspect is uh, what we would probably say to uh, people a lot is, um, um, you know, how are you, um, well, I'm probably going to answer it two ways. One, how, how do you pay it forward? I think there's a huge learning in how leaders, and that can be again at any level, but particularly at the more executive level, how and with whom have you paid it forward? Who, who have you coached? Who have you brought along? How have you brought them along? How have you developed them? I think there's sort of a ton of learning in that um, perspective that comes from sharing your perspective with others. Uh, you know, this whole concept of uh, you'll retain if you teach, or you'll know your topic if you teach. So we ask them that about who, who you've brought along, how you've brought them along, what you've done. I think another coaching advice uh, is just to ask people what are they doing to, you know, get out of their comfort zone and uh, stretch themselves. I think uh, we're learning a lot about the power of re reflection. And I don't think most executives either have enough time or build enough into their day to do that. So we can ask about that. I think it's something you can think about. Um, anyway, those are some of the two sides of that coin that I great. reflect That's great. on. Um, I am confident that we could go through dinner. There's just so much great stuff to talk about here. Uh, but I think I can speak for everybody and say thank you to the panelists for wonderful stories. Good to see you. Anybody, final comments? Or? Um, thank you. I mean, you can, you can <laughs> we're going to wrap up. Um, great. Uh, so, uh, you know, wow. I mean, how, how many of you have filled out your notebooks with things? I mean, speed dating interviews. Sure. Uh, facial tissue. Neoteny. Did I say that right? Explains my love of SpongeBob. Um, team smarts, versatile leadership. Um, so I'm just going to take a couple minutes and, and wrap us up because we've got planes to catch and things to do. Um, take a deep breath. 
Let your brain settle for a second. That's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of people. Um, before I close, I want to um, just do something very quickly, um, which is to express um, gratitude. Um, um, so Karabi's going to hate me for this, but just, I need you to stand up for just a second. Um, so uh, doing anything at Ashoka can be challenging because you've got um, a group of entrepreneurs. Like people like to create and think and design. Um, but of course, when you have people thinking creating design, you also need to um, figure out planes and name tags and get people from here to here and get people in and figure out what you're going to eat. And, um, and so um, I want to particularly appreciate the role that you've played um, in pulling this gathering together. And then I would just invite all the Ashoka staff and volunteers who played a role in this gathering to just stand up and receive our appreciation for the work that you've done. So, I mean, certainly thank you to Ashoka as an organization, as a movement, but also to the, to the leaders um, who've helped make this um, happen. Um, so I've been, I've been trying to think about how to wrap up such an amazing two days. And um, there's a piece that Roberta said. I don't know if Roberta's still here. Are you still here, Roberta? Hi, Roberta. Um, and this was picked up um, on many of the panels. Um, and I think it's at the core of, of, of some things that we've been thinking about, which you said, rather than looking at despair, um, look at hope. Right? Rather than looking at despair, look at hope. Rather than looking at problems, find solutions. Rather than complaining about what's not happening, do something. And I'm reminded of um, Paulo Freire uh, from Brazil, who's an educational activist, who wrote that when we, uh, in our struggles, right, we all struggle, uh, if we struggle without hope, our struggles will be suicidal. Um, so I want to end with this idea of hope. You know, I, I'm in the peace business, right? And so you talk about peace, and people are like, what? Like, impacts? No, peace. Um, and hope also has that danger to it, right? It's sort of light. It's fluffy. Um, but it is vital to our work. Hope is vital to our work. Um, I think about Albie Sachs, uh, who is a Supreme Court justice in South Africa. And he wrote about the ending of apartheid that all social change is impossible until it happens and then it was inevitable. And that is the idea behind hope, right? Hope is impossible, right? And then it happens, it gets fulfilled. And it's like, of course, of course the Red Sox are gonna win the World Series. <laughs> well, it took 80 years, it's gonna happen. Um, and it makes me think of smoking. Follow me for just a second. Um, so uh, my oldest daughter, when she was about six or seven, we were driving down our street in, in Dorchester in Boston, and she saw someone smoking. And she was horrified. Daddy, doesn't that woman know that she is going to die? I mean, her image was you take a puff on a menthol and you keel over dead. Um, <laughs> How could that person smoke? Smoking does bad things to you. Smoking is dangerous. I would never smoke, Daddy. And so I thought back 30 years before when I was her age, right? I had candy cigarettes. My first cigarette was given to me by a teacher. My high school had a smoking lounge for students. The glamorous people smoked, right? It was sexy. It's what you did if you wanted to be cool. And I think about the progress that we've made about, around smoking in this country, right? All social change is impossible until it happens. And then it was inevitable. So we will gather again. Maybe it'll be in three years, maybe it'll be in 30 years. And we'll look back at these things that we all sat here and thought, well, that's just how it is. It's never gonna change. And think about that collective we the work, the energy, the relationships, the seeds that were planted here, and we will have a different world. It's not gonna be easy, right? It's, it's, it's not gonna be clear, it's gonna be messy. I think it was Frederick Douglass who said in the, in the struggle for justice, the only reward is to be in the struggle. And with a great deal of humility, what I would add to that is a reward to be in the struggle together. So my hope and my wish 
on behalf of Ashoka is that the seeds that were planted here get nurtured. Right, so go home to your families. Go home to your speed dating. But take these moments, these relationships, these ahas with you. Let them grow. And share back with us at Ashoka what happened. Right? A quick email, oh, I met this person, and we're going to do this great project together. Or I'd never thought about leadership this way, but now I'm doing this differently. Right? Share back to this community. Tell us what seeds get planted, what movements get launched. So as we say in my organization, go with hope, go with peace, go out and have fun. And again, on behalf of Ashoka, thank you for showing up. Thank you for taking risks. Thank you for your generous spirit. Go forth.